It's great to see you all here. John, good to see you. Welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. Um, so John Kadunas, CEO of Mizuho Securities USA. You have a very singular perch, um, I would have to say. You are the chief executive of a very large securities operation here in the United States. You're a Wall Street veteran, companies based in Japan. So I think this gives you a very interesting perspective and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. So let's start off by going big picture, John. Um, uh, this session is called The New Normal. Um, is there a new normal in your mind? And if so, what is it? Well, Andy, um, there is a new normal. The world has definitely changed. And I think that you know the underlying theme of the world is if you look at where we were a few years ago, there, the world was in a state of excess supply. And over the last few years, uh, I'm sorry, excess demand. And over the last few years, it's changed to excess supply. Right. And what that has done is created mm -hmm. low inflation, almost a deflationary uh, uh, area in the whole world. And that's what's changed, and that's the, kind of the new norm that we see all over the globe. How is that new normal reflected in the market break that we just had in August? Are those two things related, do you think? There, there's no question. Every time there's a market break, whether it be in the stock market, whether it be in China, whether it be in Japan, it's reflected and it puts pressure on low rates. And that's one of the reasons why, if you look, the Fed hasn't done anything yet. And at Mizuho Securities, our call for several years has been not earlier than Q2 2016, and we still mm -hmm. stick to that. Oh, is that right? You're not looking for the Fed to raise rates until the second or the end of the second After half of next year? We have been calling that for over three years. Very prescient. Yes. Um, so a lot of this uh, deflationary uh, pressure um, and the market break as well seem to be coming um, from China. So what's your take on what's going on over there? I mean, that's kind of the, the big question of our time, right? No, absolutely. Well, what's happened, there's been a huge demand for production globally led by the U.S. consumer, right? And that's what had a lot of demand. And now, after it slowed down after 08, there's been a lot of supply. Mm -hmm. Now, when we have the slowdown in China, you have the commodities that they, were need, that they needed, that they, you know, they slowed down a lot. So that increases the fuel of excess supply and lower rates. Right. So, you know, the, the question about China is, okay, it's slowing the economy. The growth is slowing down. The economy is not slowing down. But you hear, hear people saying that all the, all the time, by the way. The economy is not slowing down. The growth is slowing down. Um, how much worse is it going to get? Or, or what is your prognosis for, for China right now, if I can ask you that? Sure. China is here. It's not going anywhere. When we say slow down, is it going to be 7%? No. But GDP at 3 4% yearly, it's a lot better than the U.S. has been doing. You know, it's you know, arguably the first, the second largest economy in the world. It's here to stay. It's going to be growing at a much rapid rate than most countries all over the world. So even though it's had its uh, correction, it's not going anywhere. This deflation, before we talk about some other markets, sure. this deflationary pressure comes from China, but it also comes from, from technology as well, right? And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, technology is a wonderful thing, but it does drive the price of things across the board down, and, and it's relentless, right? Technology, energy, all of this is leading to the new world and the new order of low rates, you know, deflationary and almost negative rates that some of the, you know, uh, prominent people and, and, and Fed chairman has been talking about. So technology, energy, you know, oil, with the prices where it's at right now, um, it's, it is geopolitical, but it's also, you know, supply. Right. We're finding new places where you can get oil. You know, there's fracking, there's refracking, you know, there's shale. And so, you know, it's hard to control, you know, is, is oil going to go back up to over 100 barrels? Not any, $100 a barrel? Not anytime soon. You know, if you look at Goldman, they're calling for $20 a barrel. 
Right, I Goldman know, Sachs report talking about $20 a barrel oil. I don't necessarily think it's going to go that far down, right. but I think where we're at right now, it's going to stay around this area. And fracking, of course, um, and the increased supply of oil also has to do with technology, because the more technology you can bring to bear, the more you can discover oil that previously could be tapped. That's exactly right, and it's all interconnected. Right. We didn't have the technology in order to do these things you know, 20 years ago, now we do, and that's changing everything. So here's Janet Yellen, you know, out there looking for, you know, the target inflation rate and that 2%, you don't, you don't particularly see that anytime soon, though, right? You know, there's no, look, I'm not worried about the U.S. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't lose sweet sleep over the economy going under, but it's two, two and a half growth, you know, consistently for several years. It has not changed. And, you know, I don't see anything changing that, coupled by there's no inflation. Right. You know, it, it, so that's going to be difficult for the Fed to do anything. Right. So you have this big capital markets operation and you have this view of the world and the U.S. economy, global economy. How does one position um, your book? What, what do you invest in? What's, what's attractive in this kind of environment going forward? Well, we try to be somewhat of a full service firm and some things we do better than others. And in the banking industry, you don't really position, but we work more as advisory. And you see the different types of deals that we're doing. And there's always industries, no matter what the economy is doing, that are hot, whether it be healthcare, technology, energy has its ups and downs, but there's always business to be doing there. In terms of positioning, I think that you have to look at you know, what our equity is going to do, what our bonds are going to do. We think the 10 years is going to stay pretty much in a range of one and three quarters to two and a quarter for a long time here, unless there's something extraordinary that might happen. We think equities are going to trade in this range. We had this correction. I think we'll be you know, right here for, for a while. I don't see them you know, going down that much. So uh, I think that we're, as long as there's some sort of stability, I think you know, overall this business you know, as usual. Right. Well, it doesn't sound like there's that much. I mean, you don't sound like you're a person that's really concerned about huge amounts of risk in the U.S. markets then, right? Not, not, not at all. I think the but US not a lot of upside either? So is it just sort of an indexer's market, or does that make it kind of a No, actually, picker? it's more of a stock picker's market, uh, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you don't have a trajectory either really high or really low, mm -hmm. where you're either in ETFs or index type of securities, um, where it really doesn't matter because it's more of a directional type of a move, you're going to see um, the people that are just uh, pure stock pickers and sector pickers have a lot more value in these type of markets. Right. And that's why it's value for these good asset managers and whatnot. To, uh, they're going to become a lot more prevalent right now. Let me ask you about the business a little bit. So you worked on Wall Street for a while. How, how has the business changed and, and what are what are the best ways, um, who's going to succeed on Wall Street? So what's the best way to succeed on Wall Street today? Business has changed a lot, and it continues to change. And a lot of that's been led, you know, because of D.C. and regulatory environment. Um, we have to change with that. And as um, the, all the regulatory environment has made us ring fence capital in the United States in terms of all the foreign banks, we're starting to see a lot of banks pull back or become smaller. And so that's actually helped uh, our situation in Mizuho. We've been able to capitalize. There's been a lot of great talent that we've been able to hire and get into businesses. And we went from not being in basically in the market eight years ago in terms of issuing debt to being now top 10 investment grade mm -hmm. issuer of debt in the whole world. And so that, that opportunity, because of some of the pullback of other companies, uh, has been there for us. How big is your operation here in New York? Well, we, you know, our securities operations is just under a thousand people, and then our corporate bank is uh, at least double that. Right. So let's talk about um, the the parent company's uh, country, Japan, sure. um, which is, you know, historically been a kind of an opaque market for Americans, hard to understand. Um, but they've been dealing, John, with deflation for a very long time. And this is a country that knows deflation, right? Yes. Um, Abe has come in. There's been um, optimism. 
what's your take? Give us, give us the whole deal. Well, I think the rest of the world is now starting to see what um, Japan has been experiencing for the last 20 years, and that's low rates and deflation. And they, as a culture, have been used to this. I mean, there's kids here that never knew what inflation was or is. So prices are always either stable or going down your whole life. Your whole life. And so that's, that's, that is the, that's an amazing point right there. I mean. And that's why people are, often ask, is Abenomics working? Yes. Is and, it working? That's a good question. And so, and they say, well, is it working fast enough? My answer to you is, yes, it is working, but we have to have some patience because you have a culture that's been under this deflationary environment for a long time. And so it takes a long time. See it. We're seeing different allocations of money going from cash to equities. You see, if you're either an institutional investor or even a retail, Mrs. Watanabe, if you buy this cup today at a dollar, you can wait tomorrow and get it for 95 cents yeah. in the past, right? So their savings is still very, very high. And what they've done is put it all in cash because they would make uh, you know, three to three percent or so, even if they had zero interest rates because of deflation. Now that's changing. Inflation's starting to come in. Wages are going up a bit. Inflation's starting to come in, and people have to transfer money, both institutionally and in retail. And when you do this and transfer money, they have tons of money in Japan. In retail alone, it's the equivalent of $16 trillion that's been almost predominantly in cash. As that goes to equities, not just to the Nikkei, but to the Dow, you're going to start to see some, some big movement. And you're seeing it with you know, Japanese companies buying other companies around the world as well. Yeah, they have been active doing that over the past And even year. our company has been purchasing companies and, and taking uh, you know, the advantage of this. And that's because of Abenomics indirectly? Well, it's because of the economics there. It's because the thirst for yield right. that everybody is still looking for. And, and it's yes, it's because the opportunities to grab yield is, uh, is now all over the world. And so what, are, what is the take on Abe at this point by um, executives in Japan? I mean, do they have a, uh, a positive sentiment about him at this point? Uh, I mean, he's been in, term, in the office longer than most have in the last several years, so it, it is positive. And we're starting to see some definite changes. Even in you know, cross-holdings, it's been a tradition in Japan where other companies own other parts of the companies. And that's kind of been a handcuff because if things go up or down, you're kind of, you, can't you, know, sell. you, you can't sell. Huh. And that number has been 50 almost 50% of all holdings has been cross-selling. That number today is 15% from 50. Big difference. You don't see that in the headlines. You don't feel it. But these are some of the underlying things that are working that makes us believe, makes me believe, that Abenomics is working. Are there things we can learn from both from Japan and from Abe, um, given that we may be heading into an environment or maybe already are an environment where deflation reigns? Well, I think. We are in the environment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're the only central bank uh, in the world that's looking for possible tightening. If you look at everywhere else in the world, they're still in ease mode, right? So, right. Uh, and why? And, and we're starting to talk about um, you know, uh, negative inflation. So I think we are there. And what can we learn? Well, we know that it takes time. We know that it's not easy. And we also know that not just easing isn't always uh, you know, the answer, there has to be fundamental changes within the country. Yeah. And, um, you know, one way could be tax reform as well. Right. Uh, you know, for the United States as, uh, as well. And, you know, helping strengthen corporate corporations and bringing money in and stimulating the economy to get inflation going. Can we talk about Europe a little bit, speaking of deflation? Um, what is uh, your, your take there? I mean, that's been a, you know, you talk about a protracted, unhealthy economy vis-a-vis -vis Japan, I mean, how long, how long is it before Europe kind of falls into that same category? Well, I think... Not to be bearish or negative, anyway. sorry. No, no worries. Uh, Europe, is, uh, I think it's been lagging the United States. There's been pockets of uh, very positive stories. I think if you look at where we were a couple of years ago, 
it's the landscape has changed, but there's still a lot to do. And from our mother country, Greece, I mean, I know a lot of us in this room were, you know, with uh, the Prime Minister Tsipras last night. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a lot of change that goes on there and consistency with the government to spur uh, investment in the country. And we have not seen that. And so he got reelected. Now, some people like him, some people don't. The fact is, if he can be there for a while, he can get some reforms in and grab some confidence for investment, then you know they have a chance of getting out of this. You're talking about Greece specifically. Greece specifically. Right. What about Europe? I mean, what, what happens if the EU falls apart? Um, or, or if Greece leaves the EU? Well, that's, that's a huge problem. Yes. That's a huge problem. Or a huge because, question. Well, it's a huge question, but I, I think that everybody's doing what they can to keep them in there. And uh, we saw that even when things were in much more dire straits than today, they know how important it is to keep the base together for global expansion. So they're going to do everything they can to do that, whether it be relieve debt for them and then have to work it out for the rest of the Europeans. Um, but they're going to try whatever they can to keep it together. And I think Greece, too, uh, definitely wants to be in the euro. Right. And will do what it takes to, at the end of the day to, to, to stay in. What is your take on the international organizations um, and how they work together in, in terms of the IMF and the World Bank and the European Union. Um, do you think that they work well together? Have they done an adequate job when it comes to solving some of these problems or not? Well, I'm going to be uh, next week in Lima for the IMF and the World mm. Bank meetings, mm -hmm. Brent Woods, G30, uh, which I'm, I'm part of those uh, discussions. And uh, it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult even in this country uh, that we're unified and have you know, one country, one currency, and we have the Fed. When you look at Europe, all the different cultures together, and then you take that and multiply it around the world. Having said that, I think they've done a really, really great job in difficult situations, dealing with everything and taking everybody's concerns and trying to make this work. And I think that in the past, even the Fed, who supposedly stands alone and doesn't look at um, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the world is starting to listen, starting to hear what everybody wants to do, and knows what the Fed does is contagious to the rest of the world. And that might be one of the reasons some people say why Janet didn't do anything last time around. Well, Janet Yellen, in fact, did say that she did mention um, the global situation and emerging markets and the problems there coming from China and the market weaknesses around the globe is one reason why. She did, she did. Correct. And in the past, they really didn't right. look at foreign policy. Right. And now, you know, they have to take that into account. Or if they have to, don't, but they are doing it. Right. Well, much more to talk about, John, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Please join me in thanking John Kodunas from Mizuho. <laughs>